Welcome back to our final set of ERVC notes. Today we are talking about our fourth ERVC. So we've already talked about China, Egypt, and India, and today we're going to talk about Mesopotamia. And we'll also talk about a few of the minor civilizations that were also going on a little bit after these four that become major later. So first let's review some of our essential questions. We've learned about one and two already. Today we're gonna to get to number three. So we are gonna talk about some ancient law codes finally. And uh, law is going to permeate the rest of the year for us. It's gonna come up again and again. Every civilization ends up coming up with a law code. And we're gonna see some progression from this first one we'll talk about today to major law codes throughout history, all the way connecting to what we have in modern day. So Mesopotamia is a word that literally means between two rivers. So that's where this civilization gets its name because it's located between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. And you can see that down here in our little map. Here's the Tigris River and the Euphrates River. And this green area is all of what was ancient Mesopotamia. So nowadays, this is in Iraq. So to give you some idea of where we are in the world, we're in the Middle East. And another name for this area is the Fertile Crescent. Fertile because if you know what fertile means, it means something is good for growing. So if soil is fertile, then it's really great for agriculture which makes sense then why a civilization popped up here. You got two rivers, which makes the land very fertile, which makes it perfect for farming. Uh, the other part, the crescent part, is just because it's shaped kind of like a crescent. So um, the two rivers that were in between here were pretty consistent. So similar to some of the rivers we've talked about before, um, there's yearly flooding that happens pretty consistently. And so that's what makes the soil so fertile because when the flooding goes back down, all the nutrients from the water stay in that soil and it's still good for farming. So early on, um, one thing that becomes very important in Mesopotamia is something called irrigation. And irrigation is a vocabulary word for this unit. And it just means basically taking water from one place to another. So this was done by digging ditches that were used to drain water from the river and take it where you wanted it to go. So we still do this today. So irrigation is a very big development for the advancement of agriculture and farming. So review real quick. See if you can remember what were the two rivers that Mesopotamia was in between. I'll give you a second. All right, and that's right. It was the Tigris and the Euphrates. So just to see if you remember, if not, don't worry, we're, we're gonna get it by the end of this. One of the largest cities in ancient Mesopotamia was a city called Sumer. And in Sumer lived obviously the Sumerians. So the Sumerians are important because they come up with some really big ideas that are going to be used around the world and are going to have a major impact on history. So first of all, um, the Sumerians were creators of city-states, which is just the idea of a large city governing itself. So if you think of like the state, when we say the state, we just mean the governing body, um, the, the overarching governing body. So cities that ran themselves politically. And then they were also the creators of irrigation, which we just talked about. They were the first to invent the wheel, pretty important, and the arch, also important for architecture. They developed the plow, very big for agriculture. And they also created something called cuneiform. Cuneiform is what you see over here on the right-hand side of your screen. And this was their system of writing. And this was important because it is one of the first known systems of writing that we have. 
So we have learned a little bit about hieroglyphics and hieratic script in ancient Egypt, but the Sumerians were using cuneiform. So it's similar, but a little bit different. Um, first of all, hieroglyphics were mainly pictures, right? Pictographs is what we would call them. And it just looked like pictures that symbols that represented different things. Whereas uh, cuneiform is a little closer to what we use now in the sense that it's symbols that represent sounds that make words. And there are scholars today that can read this script, believe it or not. So another thing that the Sumerians are known for is that they had a theocracy. So to review that vocab word, we learned a little bit about that in Egypt because a theocracy is a government run by a religious leader. So the Sumerians believed that the gods ruled their city and their religion was a big part of their lifestyle. They were also polytheistic, so they believed in many gods. And another big vocab word, so lots of vocab for the Sumerians, is that the Sumerians built temples that were called ziggurats. And this is my favorite vocab word because it's just fun to say, ziggurat. Um, and that's what you see up here in this top picture. So a ziggurat was just a temple. It's similar to a pyramid, but you will notice, and you'll see um, other pictures later, that while this part looks kind of like a pyramid, then the rest is more square. So it's a little bit different. So these are some of the big claims to fame for the Sumerians, and obviously that's a lot of stuff for one group of small group of people to contribute to world history because we know a lot of that stuff is still used today and is going to influence things later on. Um, one other thing I want to add that's interesting if you want to learn more about the Sumerians and their religion and their writing system is that uh, their script cuneiform was used to write a book called the Epic of Gilgamesh and this is actually a book that you can go to the bookstore and buy nowadays. It's a very interesting story, so you can actually check that out if you're, if you're curious. Okay, so within Mesopotamia, two more groups that are going to become important are the Akkadians and the Babylonians. So you'll see over here on our map, Akkad is in this blue area and to the south is Babylonia. Both are north of Sumer that we were just talking about. So the Akkadians defeat the Sumerians and they're going to spread down towards Sumer. So this happens around 2340 BC when the Akkadian leader Sargon uh, takes over and he sets up what no, becomes known as the First Empire. So this is the first empire, is the Akkadians. Um, to the south of Akkad is Babylon, and the Babylonians are led by a famous leader named Hammurabi. And here we get to essential question number three, because Hammurabi is the first ruler to really write out a code of laws. So he is famous for his law code, and it was written in cuneiform, and it is known as one of the first law codes in history ever. By a code, we don't mean it's written in like fancy words that we can't understand, we have to decode. It just means that it's a list of a bunch of laws that all go together. So think like the Bill of Rights is a law code. Um, if you know anything about Christianity or Judaism, the Ten Commandments is a law code. So this is the first known law code, one of the first. And in this law code, there are things like explaining the role of public officials. It talks about how to protect consumers, so the people that are buying and, and, and trading goods. Um, there's family law, and there's laws regarding marriage. And the famous quote from this law code is, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And you might have heard that before. It's also quoted in the Bible. And this idea is if you do somebody wrong, then you deserve the same in return. The law code here is known for being kind of harsh. So there are a lot of like punishments that result in death for things that aren't necessarily considered punishable by death today. So like thievery, theft could be punished by death. There were a lot of interesting laws within this law code. And we'll look more in depth at this later. Okay, 
Now I want to talk to you about some of the other early civilizations. So even though these aren't part of the four early river valley civilizations that we focus on in the beginning, I want to bring them up because they're all very important. So one that we mentioned previously was the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians are also known as the Sea People, and that's because they were really good at sailing and navigation. So they were some of the first to really start venturing out onto the ocean, navigating and sailing from place to place. So naturally, they're also traders. They would trade goods. And the big thing that uh, makes them very important in early history is that they have one of the first written alphabets. And that is going to be passed on to the Greeks. And the Greek alphabet will be passed on. And eventually, that becomes our alphabet, what we know as as the English alphabet. Any languages that are similar to English have a very similar alphabet and it's because they all can tr be traced back to this one from the Phoenicians. So that's very cool. Another group that's developed early on is the nation of Israel, the civilization of Israel, and the people of Israel are famous because they are the people who founded Judaism and eventually Judaism out of Judaism comes Christianity, so Israel is important to both Christianity and Judaism, and actually it's important to Islam as well. So Israel started in Mesopotamia, the Jews began in Mesopotamia, they lived in Palestine, but there was a drought, and so they left their home to migrate to Egypt. And the story in the Bible, if you read in the Old Testament or if you watch The Prince of Egypt, <laughs> Um, is that they were then taken as slaves in Egypt. They were enslaved by the Egyptians, and it wasn't until one of their leaders, Moses, comes to set them free that they leave and settle down in Israel, which is where, you know, their homeland from then on. After they settled down in Israel, the idea is that the tribes that were sort of made up this group united into what became the kingdom of Israel. Um, and for a while they were all united. One of their most famous leaders is known as King Solomon. He was known as a very wise king and he put the capital in Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem is a holy city to the Israelites and to Jews. It's also a holy city to Muslims and Christians. And this might explain a little bit of the conflict that's still going on in this part of the world over this territory. So keep that in mind because we'll come back to that idea later. Now, um, Solomon was also known for all the great buildings that he created while he was in charge and his wisdom, like I said, especially when it came to justice. So there's a famous story about Solomon that two women came to Solomon and claimed that a baby was theirs and they were arguing over whose child it was. King Solomon didn't know whose son it was. So what he did was he said, okay, well, if you can't agree, then we'll just cut the child in half and you each get one piece, which sounds absolutely crazy, right? Um, but the story is that Solomon did that, and then the real mother, when she heard him say that, was so upset and distraught, because obviously that would be killing the baby, that she he could tell who the real mother was because the other woman wasn't as upset. But he tricked them and sort of in, in making the suggestion so that he could figure out who the right mother was. So anyway, um, that's just a crazy fact about Solomon. So... Um, and that story is actually found in the Hebrew uh, Bible. And so the Bible itself, just to give you a preview, because you'll get into the some of these early religions later, um, is made up of different parts. And so Jews uh, focus on the first five books of the Bible, which is called the Torah. And that's what you see over here in this picture. And the Torah is all written in Hebrew, and that is the most important holy text for Jews. Christians um, view this as part of the Old Testament, and then they also have a New Testament. And so they have added the New Testament is part of the Christian text. After a while, Israel becomes divided because of a civil war, right, fighting within themselves. So what ends up happening is that the northern part of Israel ends up with the Assyrians. And this is where 10 of the tribes 
um, are separated into Assyria and they sort of lose their identity because they assimilate with the Assyrians. And that just means they start adopting Assyrian religious ideas and lifestyle and they start losing their culture. And then the southern part of Israel becomes known as Judah and they end up in Babylon and they get taken over by the Babylonians. And so the Jews from the beginning have had a history of being enslaved and being uh, taken advantage of as a people. And sadly, this is their history. This has been their history for a long time. And keep this in mind because you're going to hear about this again and again throughout the year. And I get a question every year, why? Like, why do they get picked on so much? And I don't have a good answer for you, but it does seem to happen. There's a sort of cycle of Jewish persecution throughout history. And so we'll come back to that idea later. But eventually um, the Persians are going to come in and they will actually give the southern tribes in Babylon a chance to return to Jerusalem later. So Israel's history, the Israelites' history is very much like going back home and then being exiled and then coming trying to get back home and being exiled again. So they're spread out. They're they're not united like they were in the beginning. Okay, another big empire or um, civilization that I want to mention is called the Kush Empire. It's also known as Nubia. And so this was important because Nubia was a major rival of the civilization of Egypt, which we've already learned a lot about. But you might not know as much about Nubia. So let's talk about it. Um, if you look over here, so here is where we were looking at Egypt, and we talked about the Delta and Lower and Upper Egypt. South of that is Nubia. So they're very close together, and the capital of Nubia is in the city of Meroe. And Meroe was very rich in an ore, uh, in iron ore, which was very useful at the time. It was used for tools, it was used for weapons, and it was very strong, and so it was a very important commodity and resource. But some other goods that they had there as well that made them very wealthy were gold, jewelry, pottery, and ivory. Those were also things that were traded in and out of the Kush Empire. So the Kush Empire was very advanced. They had architecture that was very similar to what we'll see in ancient Rome, which is famous. So Roman architecture is very much admired by builders all and has been throughout history. And actually, there is an event later in history, hundreds of years from where we're at right now um, in ancient history, where people kind of go back to this because they really love it. So the Kush Empire actually had very similar architecture to that. And they also developed their own unique written language. Um, and one thing that's very cool about the Kush Empire, and this is kind of similar to Egypt, although they take it one step further, is that they give women more political power. They So the divide between men and women is not so big in Nubia. And that's cool because what we know about the Nubian civilization is that they actually had a lot of female monarchs or queens. So they had a lot of famous queens throughout their history. And Egypt did too, but I don't think they had as many. So that's an interesting comparison and contrast there between these two rivals. So speaking of political leadership in the Kush Empire, Eventually, the Kush are going to take over Egypt in the late period of Egyptian history, and this becomes known as the 25th Dynasty. And this dynasty is ruled by a leader named Paye, and he is the first of a line of what is known as the Black Pharaohs. So yes, the remember, Egypt is in Africa, so that I think we forget that a lot of the time. We think of Egypt as being separate somehow, but Egypt is in North Africa. And so um, they had a long line of black leaders. And eventually, um, Paye and his empire move into Egypt and conquer it in 730 BC. So they remain free while the rest of Egypt is getting taken over by the Assyrians, the Persians, and the Greeks, and getting divided up between all those other groups. This part of Egypt remains under 
the control of Nubia and their leader. And during this time, the Nubian king has hundreds of pyramids built, over 200. So very similar again to Egypt in that sense. So you see a lot of similarities here. Okay, so let's take one last look at our essential questions for our ERVC notes. Um, number one, we talked about how the Neolithic Revolution with the discovery of farming changed people's lifestyles because they no longer had to hunt and gather to get food, which led to moving from place to place. Because they were farming, they had to stay put for longer periods of time, and they were also able to stay put and settle down because they had a surplus of food. So what we see from that is that people started settling down and building up their homes and cities, and that is what created the first civilizations. Number two, we talked about how cities brought about new ideas and the need for new things. And also with having more time on our hands, we had time to explore new things. So we saw the development of math, the sciences, art, and even government. And government in particular was a necessary thing because with more people growing in each city, more and more people, and more and more interaction between those people, you needed to have a system of law and order. Which then leads us to number three, our ancient law codes. So the first law code that we talked about was Hammurabi's code, and that really set the basis for how to write a law, because it designed it in such a way that we had a list of laws, they were simple, in the sense that they were listed out. It wasn't just long drawn out things, but it was short lists of rules that applied to everything from family life all the way to business. So that still influences, that's very similar to what we have today. So it is something that from hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago still impacts us today. And that is a very quick overview of our essential questions.